Houston, contact with a test. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Discovery Houston, recommend a vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery Houston, recommend a vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery four computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Gillespugin, sitting in front of the computer, is trying to type. He places both hands above the keyboard. He gives up, exhausted, and his hands drop into his lap. After resting for a time, he raises his hands again, only to drop them as before. My definition of electronic literature is, I want to say stories, because I always associate stories with literature. And electronic means that there has been either some intervention in the authoring process, which involves digital technology, or in the delivery process, which has digital technology. I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents beset by fear and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon, the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice. This was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air poetry, she says, without emotion, one way or another. I wrote this in Michigan. I actually can remember the sound of on freezing days. They may, may not have been oaks exploding, but the trees kind of popping off along the ridge. And I remember also having walked to my office and seen the afternoon melt freezing across the blacktop like crystal octopi. I'm having an incredible deja vu looking at the screen. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. A check tablecloth lay in an isolated clearing. A bottle of red wine, two glasses, cheese and bread. Walking the sound of water, water. weight capped the sound of water. Or a bottle Wait, of Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon set on a wooden tablecloth. Sauvignon set on a wooden tablecloth. Cold water. Four crystal goblets. Four crystal goblets. Midnight. Unexpectedly at midnight. Purple lupin on the hillside. Beside the Dempsey dumpster in town, walking down to the water, where the homeless gather. A flower, a flower dress. dress. Unexpected woodland events. Wait, capped spring water in winter. Or a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a linen tablecloth. Cold water. water, a flower dress, the smell of hops and honey, the smell of green in grass, outflow warm of stone by the river, the a smell of front green door. grass, under warm the eaves of the by the river, the cabin where we were working, the sound of water, white capped mountains, purple lupine on the hillside, making love. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context uh, to achieve uh, effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My breath takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen. Or it took place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell when that's possible in the future. At the present, it starts with image very dominantly and proceeds through text to sound in kind of a, a hierarchy, which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions both at the code, the sonic, 
the visual and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means. And in traditional vision-based media, you have moving pictures, you have more traditional genres, such as you know printed text where things don't move around. But electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts, how we perceive the world and ourselves, and trying to portray that using computation, using the specific processes that are unique to computers. There are two main literary parents for me, for the fiction. And one of them is Thomas Pynchon mm -hmm. and um, Gravity's Rainbow, which is a novel which contains within it music hall numbers, popular songs, equation. Uh, there are there are no there are no visible artworks, but there is a tremendous reference to the language of, of art and film and music and theater. And that was a that was a mental model for me that the novel did not have to proceed in a linear fashion using only narrative. Electronic literature for me is literature that takes advantage of the capacity of new media to um, alter the state of writing. It's, it's literature that engages its digitality. I remember sitting in my office in, in Jackson, Michigan, in community college and thinking to myself, damn, I'm going to have to teach people how to read this thing. Prepared, sugar is not a quest volume. in the for glass the door. These certain messages very clean Reach if there is no seen pleasure. variety, very, very clean small if there bridge. is no pleasure, overly moist Prepared. climate, sugar is not a volume, not having examined the room, grabbing at these rags, kindness, related to the vulture, and shape. however, in varying sides and the door, for the sake, for the sake, journey, to use, last, they open. are double, for the sake, and rapid exploration requires most common classes, while the body, by the crowd, justified by appeal, Electronic literature is two words that go together, resonate together. Uh, I, I suppose I would say it is can be considered practice involving text that resonates with considerations of media, it resonates with uh, problems of media or platforms of media, taking advantage of platforms of media, as Amrit said, or for me, resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation and digitization of information communication. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Mac Paint, if anyone knows what that is. It's just like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself. Click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text. The graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read. And the device has to be electronic. And I work with artist books. Um, I was influenced by the works that I saw, camera works, um, by um, works in San Jose, which is um, and by the art space at San Jose State that Stephen Muir, Moore curated. So I was in a field. Welcome to the live stream traversal of Mark Bernstein and Aaron Sweeney's The Election of 1912 hosted by the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. I'm Dini Gregard, the director of the lab, and with me remotely are the two authors. Also with me is Marius Fazarski, who will be joining us at the end of this traversal for a conversation with the authors and me. The election of 1912 is subtitled, A Hypertext Study of the Progressive Era. It's the only historical work published by Eastgate Systems, and it was released in 1988, um, with Hypergate authoring system produced by Bernstein himself. It's a rich, complex work that includes bitmap images, sound, simulations, and lots of text. And it tells a story about the election that even today resonates with us, particularly with the rise of aggressive platform to mitigate social ills, a politician with a blustery personality threatening to bring down a political party, and a fierce partisan battle. 
For the playthrough, we're using a three and a half inch floppy disk on which the work was originally published. We're running that on a Macintosh SE, which is using system software 6.07. Safety precautions due to COVID means that we're using a combination of Zoom, OBS, and YouTube Live in order to bring in Bernstein from Massachusetts and Sweeney from New Mexico and Pizarski from London. Um, the two authors will be guiding me here in Vancouver, Washington um, to, to handle the, the directions they give me um, over these systems. As a participant in the event, you'll be able to add questions in the YouTube chat and we'll answer those questions during the Q&A. I would like to acknowledge the work that the staff has done uh, to make this work possible. First and foremost is Greg um, Philbrook, who is the tech guru for the program and the lab. He's doing everything from OBS to live, um, YouTube live for us. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Holly Slocum, who is the lab's project manager overseeing the project in general. Kathleen Zoller, an undergraduate researcher who does, who's handling all the social media um, posting on Twitter. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. John Barber, who's doing all the sound production, and Professor David Alonzo, who's doing post-production of the video for the book that we're producing at the end of this project. Also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Nicholas Schiller, Professor Nicholas Schiller, who is the Associate Director of the lab. And without any further delay, let's go ahead and start the traversal. Thank you so much for joining us. So welcome, and we're going to be starting now. And so as you can see from the screen, we are looking at an SE30, as I mentioned, with the uh, windows open, and you can see the launcher icon. And Mark, would you like to start? Sure, go ahead and double click 1912, please. So it's loading. And as you'll notice, there'll be a bit of a lag because Mark's coming in from Massachusetts, as I mentioned, and Aaron's coming in from New Mexico, and Marius is coming in from London. There we go. So here we have the election of 1912, a hypertext study of the progressive era by Mark Bernstein and Aaron Sweeney. Uh, it's built on top of Hypergate. Uh, and was started in the mid-80s, finished in the late 80s, published in the early 90s by Eastgate. Uh, I should make it clear that most of the research and writing was actually Aaron's, and I did the hypertext design, the linking, some of the editing, and a simulation, which we'll see in a little bit. Please click on the of 1912 in the lower left-hand corner. Okay, so I'm moving there now, and I'm going to click on that little button. And I've, it's now loading on my end. Okay, here we have a cover page, Thomas Nash cartoon and a set of tabs, cover people, simulation states, issues 1912, a history button, and some major links at the bottom. Why don't we go right ahead and click on about the election? Okay, so I'm gonna move over to the interface here, click on about the election. And you'll notice that as it loads, there's buttons at the bottom, there's tabs, and there's also a menu at the top. So there's lots of places for users, for readers to access information. Yes, in the process of writing this, I had a long telephone conversation with uh, Ted Nelson, uh, who, of course, at that time was working on the design of Xanadu and was deeply concerned with navigation and the dangers <laughs> of getting lost in hyperspace. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, so as a result of those anxieties, and these anxieties were current in the research community, I think pervasively in these years, uh, 
this uh, title is very deeply concerned with uh, navigation. The presidential contest of 1912 was unique and historic. Three powerful figures representing three proud and irreconcilable political philosophies joined battle. Two of the contestants, Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, had served as distinguished terms in the White House. The third, T. Woodrow Wilson, brought a distinguished reputation that united Democratic Party to his quest to become the first Democratic president since the failure of Bryan's spectacular, unsuccessful crusade of 1896. There were many issues in 1912, but the question that mattered, the question that permeated the campaign in the era was the definition of the future. What great benefits would progress bring to America and who would receive its bounty? Let's go ahead and choose the parties of 1912 in the lower right. So I'm moving there. I think what's interesting, Mark and Aaron, you're here. Um, the work you did for researching this was amazing. So how many months did you spend researching for this project? Do you remember? I really don't remember. Um, I know I read hundreds and thousands of pages and, um, you know, this is pre-electronic, so I went to the card catalog in the library and looked stuff up and took out books and periodicals and spent time in the newspaper archives, made all my notes in longhand, photocopied them, and mailed them to Mark. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> there, there was no Google, there was no click, copy, paste, which was probably a good thing because it made me really process what I was reading as I was writing it down and, and evaluate whether it was something that should be included or something that was not worthwhile. Yeah. And, and worth emphasizing here is all of this had to fit on a very small floppy disk and be presented on a very, very small computer screen, which wasn't capable of things we now take for granted, like scrolling text. Uh, so boiling those thousands and thousands of pages of reading into a very small compass uh, was a, certainly a very considerable challenge. I think overall, we worked on this for about three years. Mm. So you started, in, you started in 86, 87, but it came out in 88, is that correct? Uh, I think it came out in 88, and I suspect we were working on it in 85, but certainly by 86. Mm -hmm. And for those of you out there, the little SE Macintosh that you're looking at, that screen is smaller than an iPad. So this is what we were using in 80, 87, 88, 89, 90-ish, right? All the way past the uh, classic. It is, it, it is, in fact, a quarter of the size mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and has uh, about a thousandth of the color resolution of the tiny new uh, iPhone 12 mini. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now we're the on the parties. Yeah. Uh, the national political scene at the opening of the election of 1912 was dominated by two major parties, both of which suffered from deep rifts. The Democratic Party remained an alliance of Southern conservatives and Northern reformers. Southern whites despised the party of Lincoln and the Negro. Because the South was solidly democratic, it contributed little to party councils. The Republican Party, too, was deeply divided. divided. The conservative faction, led by President Taft, stood for prosperity, stability, and normalcy. The progressive Republicans, in contrast, sought energetic action and reform. <clears throat> after a bitter fight, the progressives bolted the party after Taft narrowly won renomination over progressive challengers La Follette and Roosevelt. Thus was born the Progressive Party. Uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, next to the link back to about the election, we have a little dot, which is the first appearance, appearance in hypertext of the famous breadcrumb. Uh, later, this would become visited link colors but you can't have visited link colors when you have uh, no colors to uh, show the visited link. 
So there it is right there, that little dot next to about the election. I'm pointing at it right now with my cursor. Also, Mark, I noticed these um, hyperlinks here inside the text as well. And notice as I move the cursor over, folks out there watching, it turns, the cursor turns into a check mark, which was quite unique. Yes, well, the, uh, the convention became uh, to change the arrow direction or to have a crosshair, but none of that uh, had been done much or at all. And just having the hover effect the cursor was fairly radical, also fairly hard. Uh, why don't you click on La Follette? Okay. Wisconsin's having a very bad time this week, and we should pay homage to its favorite son. <laughs> and it's coming up. La Follette did not consider Roosevelt to be a true progressive, saying that he was progressive enough to rally other progressives behind him, but not so progressive as to disturb big business. Running in several Republican primaries, La Follette carried Wisconsin and gained many additional delegates before Roosevelt entered the race. In a Philadelphia speech in early February, plagued by a cold and worry over his daughter's impending surgery, La Follette stumbled, speaking badly and at great length. His speech droned on well past midnight. La Follette shocked foes and well-wishers alike. Roosevelt, claiming that his ally's health was shattered, promptly withdrew his support. Mark, I remember when I was taking history um, as a young person here in Texas, the, um, the party that Roosevelt um, founded after he left the Republicans was called the Bull Moose Party. The word progressive didn't show up in the Texas school books. Well, it was legally the Progressive Party, mm -hmm. but uh, it was uh, often referred to as the Bull Moose Party because that was its symbol, and Roosevelt just loved reminders of his outdoorsiness. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Aaron, can, can, can you see this? Do you want to take a turn steering? I can't see it, so you'll have to, it's okay. going to be on you. Okay, no problem. Uh, let's go to La Follette on trusts then. Okay, I'm clicking there, the button at the bottom. And it's loading. La Follette did not consider Roosevelt to be a trooper. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's it's still loading. It, there it is. Roosevelt was made president of the United States. There were 149 trusts and combinations in the United States. When he turned this government over to William Howard Taft, there were 10,020. The number of trusts and monopolies is multiplying. There has been no diminishing under the present administration. I do not believe the man who was president of the United States for seven years while the greatest trust birth of this country occurred at the very time of all times in the history of the Sherman Law when it could have been made productive in destroying trust organization. I do not believe that the man who was president during this time is the man to find the way out now. Robert La Follette, Senate, August 16th, 1912. So this, this brings me to a question for Aaron. You have in this hypertext a lot of direct quotes. There's newspaper clippings and all of this. Um, what, how did you go about deciding what text to bring into this hypertext? from all the archives that you were looking at? Because what well, I really wanted to focus on original sources as much as possible. So I did try to find like copies of speeches and, and you know, things that, that they wrote, not just what somebody else said about them. Um, and I also wanted to incorporate some cultural things from the newspapers, like not just, this big headline for the day, but you know, things like, so this happened too, and somebody put it in the papers, it just kind of give a sense of, of where people were, think, what people were thinking about at the time. 
Yes, because I think what's interesting is that this is the first and the only historical hypertext that Eastgate System published. And essentially, history, his, you know, historical documents like this are stories. And you've told a story about this time period, which is very much like the time period we're experiencing right now. This, is, this resonates with today's politics in a very presaging way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it feels like we haven't come all that far. But... But uh, yeah, well, and I thought, because when we, when we were doing, you know, in the original talks about it, you know, like um, Marius asked Mark the other day, if it was possible to change the outcome, can you play the game and win? And I thought that was the whole point from the beginning is that to incorporate all different sources so that people could use them through the course of the game to change the outcome if they wanted to. So I think the way I would probably recast this hypertext is as a historical game, right? I mean, that's essentially what it allows us to do. And the mistakes that we made in this period, we can, re, we can redo, right? We can step back and fix things if we wanted to. And we can then, you know, uh, we can then fix them today if we were smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... Nobody today reads history and remembers that that kind of stuff happened. <laughs> I, know. I know. Well, I'm situating this with uh, what people were thinking about at the time. There was tremendous interest in uh, writing history with other media, and but both interaction and film and illustration and simulation. And uh, that this really starts quite early, but it, uh, McLuhan was, of course, the standard bearer for incorporating hot media into academic history and similar disciplines. Yeah. And our view, I think, uh, for both of us was that the important thing was the ability to let the participants speak with their own voices in a context where uh, they didn't know what was going to happen, and things might have gone differently. And the conti uh, contingency, which of course in the coming decade, for better or worse, would become uh, a very hot topic in historiography indeed, but the contingency of events uh, can be brought out quite subtly by the contingency of the links and the way the same quotation can fit in between Lots of different links. Yeah. So here we are with La Follette Roosevelt's record on trust, and we're gonna where, where are we gonna go from here, folks? Choice. Why don't we head to states? Okay. Or issues. Oh, I just. You can, all right. You know well. what? This is a good chance to show people the history. So Mark changed his mind, and I had already clicked states. So if I hold the cursor down on history, I can go back up one and go back to where we were and then click on issues. So that shows you how Mark is provided in this hypergate system a way to go backwards. And now I'm clicking on issues. The first appearance of the back button, which mm -hmm. I believe Intermedia already had at this point, but a very early appearance of something that would become the notorious famous back button. Yep. Yes, I saw this same use of history in Sarah Smith's King of Space used there. I don't remember seeing it in Robert de Chiera's A Sucker in Spades, but it was in Sarah Smith's work. So here we are, Mark. Yeah. So here's a list of key issues that faced the candidates in 1912. Uh, uh, these uh, directory pages are showing the direct influence of intermedia and um, the early hypertext writing of George P. Landau, uh, who just loved these sorts of uh, internet hierarchical visual guides. Mm -hmm. So we have aid to farmers, women's suffrage, working conditions, trust and monopolies, the Negro question, primaries, referenda, and judicial recall, and more. <laughs> uh, why don't we try fair business practices? Okay, so I'm going to move my cursor over and click on that box, and you'll notice that the little check mark comes up again, and it'll be changing over. 
So while it's showing up on the screen for everybody, um, there are three works published with Hypergate. I mentioned Sarah Smith's King of Space and Robert De Chiera's uh, A Sucker in Spades. This work by Mark and Aaron is the first of the three. And so it set the bar for the rest that came after. Yes, there actually was a fourth of the uh, Hypertext 87 Digest, which incorporated the interlinked position papers from the first Hypertext conference. And if you have a but, copy uh, of that, I'm sure I'd love to have it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure I have one, but I think it's uh, probably best forgotten. Uh, so the forces of steam, rail, and shipping had contributed to unprecedented growth and by 1912 had given rise to powerful and controversial giant corporations. Conservative politicians like President Taft scorned any interference with the rights of proprietors to run their own businesses. Progressives like La Follette and Wilson argued that the government could and must regulate business to protect workers, competitors, and customers from fraud and abuse. The socialists went even further and sought to let the people rule the powerful corporation just as they ruled the nation. Reacting to the socialist threat, but not willing to follow Taft and insisting that each businessman could do as he pleased, Roosevelt led a group of moderate progressives in calling for reform and regulation while preserving the rights of capital. Okay, from here, um, where do you think you may want to go? Let's go visit Bernie with the socialists. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to move over here and you'll notice that I'm going to the hyperlinked word socialist. socialist. It is quite amazing to see that within this work, you could rewrite the history to be a socialist history even before the Russian Revolution. Yeah. Well, in 1912, Eugene Debs ran for president on the socialist ticket. He pulled more votes than any socialist before or since. While he never expected to win the election, Debs convinced many, many voters to cast their lot with him rather than with the traditional parties. The Russian Revolution was still five years away in 1912, and many contemporary writers fully expected the socialists to become a powerful force in American politics. For the sake of simplicity, we have admitted Debs' candidacy, candidacy from the political simulation, a mission that does a disservice to a brave and important man. Uh, and I, I think that that's pretty much the way I feel now. Uh, it, I don't think there was a route for him to actually win in 1912. Mm -hmm. But uh, one can see how if World War I had not happened, as it did, uh, socialist America was a real possibility. And uh, we need to be able to recapture that. Certainly, Roosevelt thought it was a real possibility. Let's go read his acceptance speech excerpt. Okay, so I'm clicking on that now. Again, we had no uh, scrolling and a 342 height available uh, for the screen, no anti-aliased fonts. So uh, the all you have is black and white. Uh, this means that the amount of text you could fit into a Lexia is uh, absolutely appallingly tiny. But nevertheless, uh, thorough research and concentration did get some gems. The infallible test of a political party is the private ownership of the sources of wealth and the means of life. Apply that test to the Republican, Democratic, and Progressive parties and upon that basic fundamental issue, you will find them essentially one and the same. They differ according to conflicting interests of the privileged classes, but at the bottom, they are all alike and stand for capitalist class rule and working class slavery. The new progressive party is a party of progressive capitalism. It is lavishly financed and shrewdly advertised but it stands for the rule of capitalism all the same, standing as it does for the emancipation of the working class from wage slavery, 
for the equal rights and opportunities of all men and all women, for the abolition of child labor and the conservation of all childhood, for social self-rule and the equal freedom of all. The Socialist Party is the party of progress, the party of the future, and its triumph will signalize the birth of a new civilization and the dawn of a happier day for all humanity. Hmm. Uh, how about Roosevelt's response? Keep going on that. <clears throat> it's not ironic that tonight we have two town halls, one by Trump and one by Biden. Very interesting. I think that a will of the wisp is too slight a term to apply to Brother Debs. <laughs> I think that no working man will get what he seeks from the socialists and that he will be harmed rather than helped by such an association. Mr. Debs wishes to pull down in a spirit of hatred. I wish to build up in a spirit of brotherly love. Some of the socialists want to go so far that they can't see where they're going, and I can't either. If you try to take all the steps towards reform at once, you'll find it quite a straddle. <laughs> you'll probably split yourself and not get anywhere. <laughs> Interesting response. Um, so from here, Mark, where do you want to go? Let's try the tab for 1912. Okay, I'm going to click there. Life in 1912. The turn of the century prompted a great surge of thought and examination as the nation reviewed its life and spirit and examined its soul. A generation of writers, scholars, and politicians studied the condition of the man in the street and struggled to build a better and more just society. Oh, let's look at some advertisements. Okay, click on that. These are fascinating. The first one comes from the Pittsburgh Gazette, Mark, so that's going to show up in just a second. Yes, men wanted tinners, catchers, and helpers to work in open shops. Syrians, Poles, and Romanians preferred <laughs> steady employment and good wages to men willing to work, fair paid and no fees charged. Cited in 1912 Wilson campaign literature as an example of discrimination against American in labor in the steel industry. <laughs> so there's that ad. Yes. You want to see so, more? Yeah, let's have more. Okay. This one's coming up. It's from, uh, looks like it's just a general ad about autom automat automatic. Use the automatic during the convention. So here it comes. Make the automatic telephone station at the Coliseum your headquarters. The reception room, booths, and uniform pages at your service on the main floor of the annex. Does somebody maybe need to turn the mute on their computer so that they don't hear background noise? I'm sorry. I think that's How about just put a mute? Yeah, on. just put mute. That might help a little bit. There we go. Thank you. So, Mark, um, yeah. this is interesting, and I love the image there. So can I ask you about, while we're on this page, do you want to mention how the images came about? Oh. The images, Aaron would find images that could be Xerox decently, which is itself hard. We'd take the best available photocopy, or on rare occasions, we'd be able to dig up a original. And then these were uh, digitized using a object called the Thunderscan, which uh, was a 
a scanner that fit into the cartridge of the dot matrix printers that were then available. <laughs> and I'd use the dot matrix printer as a carriage to scan a pixel by pixel image of the current line and then to advance a 72nd of an inch to the next line. Uh, and again, it only had two bits of color resolution. Of, so they had characteristic issues with um, tonal dither and uh, simply uh, aliasing artifacts that now look uh, nostalgic to some people. Uh, but, but you do get a sense that this is an old fashioned phone which in 1912 was a marvel of advanced technology, so valuable that you had people in uniforms to attend you while you used it. <laughs> also, that local call five cents is roughly speaking four or five dollars a call uh, in more recent uh, more recent money. So so it's inexpensive it's low cost, it's a relative thing. <laughs> Shall we go for one more ad? Sure. Okay. Erin, do you want to talk about how you found the ads and what the ads are doing here? I'd love to hear about that. And you have to unmute yourself, Erin, now. Well, yeah, I did. Everybody left the room, so sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, as I, the ads kind of came in like, as I was reading stuff in the newspapers, and and then I would I would see them, and I and I thought they were so different from the things that we see, and and some of them were just so hysterical, you know. But they were deadly serious at the time when they were making these advertisements, and so I thought, well, that's that's a fun little snapshot of of you know where this is where society was and what what people were, were buying, what was new, what was innovative, what was exciting to them. And, you know, yeah. And then some things like the one about Syrians and Armenians preferred that, you know, we could never put out today without, you know, getting trolled wherever. So it was just kind of a, I don't know that we, that I set out to find them as much as when they came up, it seemed like a fun thing to include. Mm -hmm. So. That's really how that happened. Well, this one's even fascinating. Mark, you want to read this one for Aaron to comment on? Service to lots via the road of courtesies to the north and west. It's the dining car that makes the trip. New steel frames, electric lighted, vacuum clean trains. And the caption reads, good morning, is breakfast ready? And it's a woman standing at the dining car with Table set, ready to go. And, but but th th this too is an important element of history. I read a fascinating uh, paper earlier this year. I got no idea why, but, but it was wonderful about the role of Fred Harvey, the concessionaire uh, for the competitor to this railroad, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Uh, and they handled food service. And they ended up having an immense role in our perception of the Southwest and our perception of the Native Americans of the Southwest and our perception of what people in the Southwest ought to be eating. <laughs> Mark, one more thing about this, this ad. I notice a lot of um, all caps. And I think you used all caps for a specific reason. You mentioned on Monday in our discussion. Uh, we didn't have effective bold for all of these fonts. And uh, in some cases, if you bolded in the middle of a passage, it was all uh, ineffective. And so all caps was a ersatz way to do emphasis. Um, style text is hard. Mm -hmm. And again, the, the, the processor for which this was originally purposed uh, has less computing power than today's watches <laughs> and is competitive with today's toasters. I mean, seriously. Um, so uh, we're, we're talking about very little compute capacity 
dealing with things like just encoding tables of when uh, you want to embolden a word uh, was at or beyond the limits of what we could manage. So shall we drive somewhere else? We have six items. Uh, can we take a quick look at the simulation? Yeah, oh, I love the simulation. This is one of Mariusz's and my favorite features of this work. Absolutely. Simulation uh, makes this game a, a very fascinating hybrid work of hypertext and, and game. Yeah, and here it, we uh, that, that That's exactly right. The idea was to have a simulation, but to argue that the simulation was really part of the hypertext, and the hypertext is really part of the simulation. And uh, that the simulation, too, could be hypertextual. Uh, so uh, I don't know. We could start with traveling. Yeah. All right. So Mark, one question for you as we click on this um, and it starts to load. Did you, were you already thinking about the term oops, hypermedia? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you broke up under the sound of the choo-choo train. Yeah, let's go back to the choo-choo train. I'm going to go back here for a second. It's such a cool simulation. So let's go back and do it again. So I'm going to click on travel. <laughs> My question was, were you thinking of hypermedia at the time in 1987? That, that was a term that came a little bit later. But well, hypertext and hypermedia are and always were the same <laughs> thing. Uh, in fact, we were a little bit out in front of our skis in saying this in 1987, 1988. Uh, but but not far. And I think by this time, at least in academia, it was understood that all these things are texts. Mm -hmm. The picture of the locomotive is a text that people read that signifies something, as does the mm -hmm. sound of the uh, train, which is not, in fact, a real train sound. It's a sound effect. <laughs> but um, it re recalls the sound of trains, which readers might know about from movies or experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't you click on a city? Well, how about Detroit? OK, let's go to Detroit. Go right. And that will send Roosevelt to Detroit. So there it is. And you can see Teddy Roosevelt right there. It'll show up there as a go. little. Just, just click on the dot. And now you can dismiss that window now that we're there. Okay, I'm doing that. Or, or if you wanted to go to, say, Des Moines, Des Moines is now only one day further away. You see the other candidates are also moving. So let me go back a second and show them that. So here's... Okay, we could look at the regional issues where we are. Okay, I'm going to go back there. All right, so regional issues, click coming. It's going to take a second because I went back and showed where Des Moines was. And as we're waiting for that to load, notice at the top there's these items, bookmark, notes, and simulation. So some redundancy there to find simulation. Okay, there it is. So if you click on, let's say, 40-hour work week, I believe we'll see which state's 40-hour work week seemed especially pertinent to. And it's coming up. Come on. There we go. And click on, oh, uh, fairness to Negroes. Why not? Okay. I'm going to click on that. So this is a ancestral infographic of, of yeah, not, not that dissimilar to the sorts of uh, interactive map charts that we unfortunately are seeing many of in this time of COVID. Uh, let's 
dismiss this window with an OK. And it takes us back to the simulation panel. Yeah. <clears throat> and let's give a speech. OK. I'm going to go over here. And I love the image here. It looks like a radio and a flag or something. Well, not in 1912. It's not a radio. That's a podium. But, podium, But this okay. is an example of the problems of uh, really bad artwork and uh, really limited uh, palette. Uh, as you can see, the icons are 32 or 64 bits. Mm -hmm. So right here, all we can do is meet with local press and politicians because right now our support is iffy and this is a marginally democratic state. So we'll go ahead and meet with the local press and politicians because that's what's on offer. So go ahead and click on that. Okay. It's coming. And let's there we go. Uh, oppose protective tar tariffs okay. and offer patronage. And hit OK. I like the use so, charm, Mark. That's kind of okay. That's kind of cool too, right? This reminds me a little bit of Moxie and magnetism. Yes. Uh, I mean, one, one of the issues here is that Roosevelt was a fantastic campaigner of exceptional ability. And as, uh, you know, in terms of both simulation and simply establishing the interest that things might have gone differently, uh, it's worthwhile remembering this. Uh, this is the guy who a few months later than we are at in the simulation was shot by an assassin uh, in front of his hotel as he was leaving to give a speech in Milwaukee. Said, oh, ouch, that hurts. <laughs> Got into the carriage, went, gave a speech, an abbreviated speech for which he apologized just having been shot, <laughs> uh, and then went to the hospital. Uh, <laughs> let's look at a couple of newspapers. Okay, I'm gonna click over here. Didn't Reagan quip also when he was shot? Didn't he make a... So here we have actual news of the day that Aaron dug up. Uh, feared asylum attendant made her pregnant. Daughter-in-law of Confederate general takes poison. <laughs> Next. Okay. Next we have New York Times. Lady smoker shocks passengers. <laughs> Sensation on Cunard's Laconia. <laughs> uh, again, the the it there's an interesting mix in this era of shocking sexism and actually really fine writing about the rights of women. Uh, and communicating this, so uh, go go ahead and click next. But communicating this is fascinating. Next they weren't all idiots, but some of them were. <laughs> Next is the DC Tribune coming up. Okay, now this this is a synthetic newspaper story. Uh, uh, one of our opponents has actually done something while we were giving a speech. Uh, Taft in DC has met with the people who would meet with him in DC and taken a stand that is calculated by the AI to appeal to local leaders. Uh, this sort of synthetic news interspersed with real news, I think had already been pioneered by balance of power. Mm. Uh, but uh, again, it's something that is kind of new and kind of interesting and 
decidedly hypertextual. Uh, just glancing at my screen, I think we're getting to the point where we want to be talking about questions. Yeah, we're getting close to questions. I think this has been just fascinating. May I show a few more things so that we, well, sure. we have the opportunity to document this? Uh, Mark, I, what I was mentioning earlier is that this menu is, you know, there's some really conventional um, menu items here like file and edit, but bookmark is fascinating because you can mark this mark pages, right? And these elements are redundant in various places. The note taking is interesting. Do you want to comment on the notes here? You can edit notes. Oh. Well, you, you can add margin notes. Um, you can add a margin note or a reference note. And I, for the life of me, don't remember what the difference are, but you can attach small annotations mm -hmm. to uh, each page, which was intended both for the convenience of students and uh, engaged readers. And we had a rhetorical uh, aspirational desire to let people write in their hypertexts. Mm -hmm. uh, it was hard to do at this point, but uh, we certainly wanted mm -hmm. to provide the familiar affordances of the book, both because people really want to use them, and for things like margin notes, you can do them better on uh, electronic media than you can in paper anyway, and because at this point, we were being belabored about the head at every turn by people who thought we were conspiring to end reading and make America stupider by everyone is going to learn history from mm -hmm. cartoons. Mm -hmm. Again, McLuhan, uh, with the best of intentions, played into the hands of the opposition on that and made it sound like TV was a really great replacement for books. Uh, we weren't replacing books. We were designing something that would be better than books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was an interesting um, feature, the notes. And then, this, of course, here's the simulation. You can save your simulations that you want to save, reset your saves and things like that here. And then at the bottom, you had all of these tabs, and these tabs you had to cover. You had people. I'm going to bring that one up so you can see. This is a fascinating little interface here where you can send a telegram, but you have to know who to send a telegram to so you can have an address book, right, Mark? And Aaron, yep. you did an amazing job organizing all of these names, all these major figures, and even folks like Ida Tarbell, who's been forgotten, I think, in con contemporary society, Hoke Smith. We in Washington know Gifford Pinchot because of the park, I mean, uh, because of the... Uh, wildlife refuge and, and uh, all of that. So, but here are all these people that you had done that Jane Addams. Um, and then Mark, I think the other thing that we didn't get to in this reading was the, not they're not guard fields then, but you have this ability to mark a space. You can't do something until something else is done, which is similar to a guard field. Yeah. Uh, Dynamic links uh, were a important feature in my early writing about Hypergate. Uh, and of course they were important in story space. I thought that you know, for something like 1912, uh, dynamic links would mostly about, be about maintaining coherence, making sure things didn't happen before uh, precedent things had actually happened. Uh, but in fact, so so there I'm talking about varying story, uh, where mostly since then we understand that they're useful for controlling plot, the way things are presented um, in a more or less fixed story. Mm -hmm. But unusually for me, this is a work where the story is at least notionally unfixed. Mm -hmm. That's, but that was a really fascinating, these things that we take, a, take for granted today about hypertextual environments, these were all in, in I don't know, in, in discussion and debate. And um, at this time that we were building these early systems, right? And here's states, another tab. And this one allows you to look at key states. And we're having discussions today about swing states 
Here's this discussion about um, six different states that are um, important to this election. Once again, the issues. And then um, 1912 again. So that's interesting. And then plus you have all these buttons. And then once again, we have the breadcrumb next to things we've already looked at. So this interface is so fascinating the way you offloaded a lot of information. I haven't done a full inventory um, on the pages, but I'm guessing there's probably I'm, I'm over 300 pages easily in this in screens in this work. Aaron, do you have any memory of that at all? How much content you had to uh, keep? No, unfortunately, I, I don't. Now I wish I kept all those notebooks, but I probably don't have them anymore. Boy, if you do, let me know. <laughs> I'd love, love to see that. Absolutely. <laughs> so we're, we're kind of segueing smoothly into the Q&A. So I'm going to open up the Q&A to people in the YouTube chat. And um, Mariusz is going to be asking questions as well, and now we're going to continue this conversation, but include more people. So I'm looking at the YouTube chat right now, and I'm seeing people have been commenting the whole time during the traversal. So if you have a question, go ahead and post it, and I will ask it to Mark and to Aaron. So feel free to do that. In the meantime, Mariusz, why don't you kick off the first question? Absolutely. Um, Mark, you have mentioned that uh, Ted Nelson uh, uh, was reading, uh, was a best reader for this uh, work. Could you uh, maybe tell us a bit more what was, uh, what was his impressions, uh, what was uh, his uh, main concerns? Well, he, he was quite polite and he was, he wanted to explain the dangers of getting lost in uh, hyperspace, as many people like to refer to it then, of uh, disorientation. Uh, the first, the early prototypes had much less navigational apparatus. And uh, he felt that the organization was uh, hard to grasp. Uh, the interpenetrating hierarchies uh, caused trouble for lots of people in that era. Uh, there were two investigators in particular, uh, Franca Garzato and Paolo Paolini at the Politecnico di Milano, uh, who were very interested in hypertext formalisms and did some very early work with Daniel Schwabe on uh, hypertext patterns. And they uh, did a model of 1912, which discovered places where they found missing pages. Uh, pages that a completely regular structure uh, would have predicted would have existed if it had been generated by a schema. Uh, their feeling was that the right way to do this was in fact to generate the pages from a schema and then populate them. Uh, where what we ended up doing was generating pages that had some consistent, some schematic consistency, but if we didn't have the information or we couldn't fit the information in, or there was something more important or more fun that we wanted to fit in, uh, the, the top of the floppy disk was always in sight. Uh, and so strict regularity didn't matter very much. And it feels as such, it feels much more natural. Uh, you could feel that this argument is, is given in a, in a human, natural way for the reader. Uh, I've also seen that used uh, this work to be used in education. There are some uh, document uh, web pages that document uh, use of, uh, of election 1912 in the class, which is uh, something very, very uh, where, where it should be. Uh, but in the end, I guess uh, the hypertext research has found out that there is no reason for being uh, worried about the uh, reader being lost. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess what we can also conclude now that there, there is a bit of a, um, uh, too much of this navigational apparatus, right? Oh, I, I think there is. I think um, it uses too much of precious screen space. But, but again, we're not talking about addressing readers in 2020, talking about addressing readers 
uh, to whom the, the earliest adopters, the people who went out and bought this new thing on the day it was available, had only owned their Macintosh for two, two years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so people who had never seen anything like this before, used anything like this before, and often people were nervous. So I was one of those people that had access to these things. I was buying HyperCard at the end of the, you know, 1988, 1999, and using that HyperCard. And one of them that I bought was about the philosophers. And it was a kind of animated GIFs and lots of sound. And but it was it it was true. I mean, it was real information. It wasn't it wasn't. Um, false information. If you looked at an encyclopedia, if you looked at any of the books on Aristotle, it followed exactly what he was saying, but it did kind of bring it down in some sort of very concise way. And it was that, it was, I think it was that very thing that it would not complicate or make things complex um, in, terms of its in terms of its information is what people were nervous about. Along with the technology, you know, they didn't want to believe that we could teach any other way than with a book. And that's still a problem we're facing even in 2020 with a lot of people in academe, right? I mean, it's not just the lack of complexity, it's just the, it's the form. And the thing about hypertext that makes it so interesting is it can be complex and all the information can be there. David Cole points out that his work with Socrates and Lambeth, as complex and brilliant as it is, you know, his fellow philosophers did not um, accept the work as a work of philosophy. David's work was accepted by the hypertext community. And so it's that problem still prevails today, those of us that teach in academe, right? So. If, if a publisher approached you today and said, let's make a remake, uh, let's put it on a modern platform, and you, have, you would have a voice in it, what would be your choice? Oh, what platform would be my yes. choice? Story space. How, how would you see it? Uh, where would be the best place uh, for it? Uh, oh, I have not given that the slightest thought. Uh, for first, I think on any modern platform, we'd really want to deepen this uh, and have uh, much more depth. You know that th this slid down rather accidentally into the. Uh, you know, to, to being didactic. And uh, that's mostly the effect of the roof of the uh, floppy disk. And so, so I'd, want, I'd want it to be much bigger and uh, much more detailed and precise and nuanced. Uh, I don't think there's anything that we did here that you couldn't do in HTML5. And so that would be a natural, but if you want to do something on a different platform, that's fine too. Marvel Springs uh, got migrated into um, a wiki uh, formula and uh, Wikipedia sort of framework. Uh, I guess this work would have to be a bit more into uh, HTML5 with multimedia sounds. Yeah, all yeah. and you of uh, any, anything historical in a wiki format we now know is deeply problematical so you <laughs> lose the good parts of the wiki to the trolls and the gru mm -hmm. and uh, so why are you going to uh, accept the bad parts of the wiki so we have some questions here from the audience uh, uh, kathleen zoller asked i have a question about the map why illustrate the entire map of America when it only features the eastern states? What is this meant to emphasize? Do you remember that, Mark? Should we go back and look at the map? Oh, I, I think uh, <clears throat> I, I wanted everyone to start out in the east because that's where they spent most of their time and where historically they were on our starting date, which I think is August 15th. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can go to California you can go to uh, Seattle. It, it's actually fairly onerous to get to either. And it's going to take a hunk out of your campaign schedule, but you can get there. And there are enough uh, electoral votes in the West to make it useful. 
Okay, that's a, thank you for that. Ka uh, Holly June asked, Aaron, what is the hypertext nature, hypertext nature of the project? Uh, excuse me, did the hypertext nature of the project influence what kind of information you collected in your research? Did that help hone it down in some way and focus it? Uh, I don't think so as much as I, I wanted to balance everything as, as well as I could in terms of, you know, presenting things about all the different parties and then finding as many different people involved, you know, not trying to concentrate in one area. But I didn't, I didn't go about it with an idea of what the final format was going to be. We just discussed things that we wanted to include along the way and Mark would let me know that maybe I needed to do some more of something else. And, and uh, but I didn't edit as what's it going to look like in the end and how do I do that now? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, Michael Joyce used to define uh, constructive hypertext mm -hmm. as a structure for what is becoming. And uh, that's really what this was and why uh, the right, Aaron's writing for this was so important and so interesting. I don't think Aaron could possibly mm -hmm. have seen a hypertextual his, history work before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly hadn't and none of the readers had either. Uh, so this was right, and, and we were building out Hypergate as we were doing the research and writing. Uh, so in fact, uh, we didn't know the medium for which we were writing and we were building the medium alongside. Thank you for that. Richard Snyder asks, as a follow-up, do you see our current hypertext-infused information society as more capable of dealing with contingency and nuance in the interpretation of history and current events? And I think that would go to you, Mark. Okay. Um I am now of two minds about this. Um, in my very first keynote talk in, I think, 1991, I, I got to do a keynote as an emergency pinch hitter. And I improvised a well-received talk about the importance of hypertext for helping us understand complicated things like the legend of uh, letting legislators know what they're voting on before they cast their votes and uh, letting policymakers understand the issues before we end up with a nuclear war or ecological catastrophe. And I really spent much of my career talking about hypertext as a line of defense against ignorance. Um, you can fit more information and more viewpoints in hypertext. Uh, I wrote a book intertwingled last, uh, last mm -hmm. year and almost two years ago mm -hmm. uh, that almost recants this because in fact, our legislators do not want to understand what they're voting on. Our legislators want to get reelected and understanding what they're doing is often orthogonal to what they really want. Uh, that's counsel for, for a writer and uh, someone who spent a career trying to improve uh, books. Uh, that, that's dismal and I'm not entirely sure I buy my argument here, but it's something that we absolutely do have to take into account at this point. So that brings me to a, a question from my, from my own self or a comment I want to make and let you respond to, but one of the things that's been fascinating me all the years I've known you and your work, um, and that's been since 1991, Mark, we go back a long way, is your contribution to the publishing world, particularly the electronic media. And you've done, you've published, um, by my count, 48 titles through Eastgate and numerous books, right? You've put out um, reading hypertext and a whole of intertwingled and all those works. Um, so can you comment about the, the publishing 
um, vision that you had and what you see is coming down the pike, especially as you're building out Tenderbox and the different other tools that you've been, you know, been working on all these years, 30 years, oh. 30 plus years. <laughs> Okay, big question. Lots of interesting <laughs> facets. Uh, very early on, uh, K. Eric Drexler, the nanotechnology guy, wrote a interesting book, Engines of Creation. And that's about nanotechnology and hypertext. Two things he was interested in at the time. Uh, they don't really have a whole lot to do with each other, but he's good on both of them. Uh, and he distinguished between publishing hypertexts and hypertext publishing. And the distinction he wanted to make was that hypertext publishing was creating docuverses like Nelson Xanadu or what the World Wide Web turned out to be. And that this was a noble, noble sorry, civilization scale enterprise that we should get working on because it was going to take a lot of effort. Where just publishing freestanding hypertexts was simple and uh, more like book publishing. And I said, okay, I see that. And I see why what Nelson wants to do is bigger and more important. And then a couple of years later, I was at a hypertext and people were talking about Michael Joyce's Afternoon again, which <laughs> I didn't like the first time I read it. Uh, but because people were discussing it, I reread it and I liked it much better the second time. And I thought this is something that we could usefully do as a small company. Uh, we could publish sample hypertexts that would be uh, standards that people could use to test in their laboratories. Uh, this era, everyone was building a hypertext system which, for which they would write hypertext that their undergraduates would read mm -hmm. and have their graduate students run experiments on the undergraduates. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the very model of a methodological problem. Uh, so we thought publishing some standard shared hypertext would, would help this. It didn't, but it helped other problems. Uh, and the other ingredient was about this time for completely set independent reasons, having nothing to do with hypertext, uh, Catherine Kramer came to work for Eastgate for about a year. Uh, and she was an experienced author and more important editor of genre fiction editor. And uh, she really taught me a lot about editing and publishing, including that the publishing world is full of people who mostly put on uh, their pants one leg at a time, <laughs> uh, something that's easy enough to learn when you're in college. That's that. Thank you for that. Um, and I have a, a comment for Aaron. So Aaron, one of the things I want to get recorded in this um, in this traversal is your contribution and the fact that when I reached out to you to invite you to participate in this, you were taken aback by the fact that you were considered a pioneer. <laughs> so now that I've read your biography and I see what you've, what you've done since this, this uh, hypertext, one can easily argue that you're a pioneer in many areas. So can I get you to talk a little bit about your experience with Mark, putting this together in terms of your place and what you're doing at Williams uh, and um, you know, and um, then thereafter, what you're doing currently. Are you still there? Well, yeah, uh, yeah I'm still here. I just, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I think it, it started out because um, as I met the Eastgate folks in this, the Swarthmore cohort, um, the first thing I did for them was they were, they were doing reviews of technical manuscripts and, and they started asking me to edit them because I find most of those things totally unreadable and unusable. And so that's how, it, that's how it started out. And we were do you know, they were most, they were more into the technology side and I was more into the literature, 
history side because I was an English and philosophy major and, you know, I just like geeking out on that kind of stuff. And so, you know, um, sadly, I never really saw the finished product until the other day. So, so that kind of blew my mind. I remember sitting there doing endless swapping out of floppy disks with the little tiny Macs that we had. Um, and then, you know, as I, you know, moved through my life where I was really, you know, I'd been a horse girl my whole life. And, and so I was keep, was keeping, trying to keep that going because I had large aspirations on a small budget. I only got, you know, so far with that, but, you know, as I, uh, as I moved out West, and, you know, was, you know, galloping race horses and then farming and now ranching, um, you know, I did take on a lot of non-traditional jobs mm -hmm. and things that I tasks, skills, you know, I mean, I can drive a swath or I can fix them. I can drive a semi, um, <laughs> I can doctor a cow, you know, I can identify plants. I can do a lot of different things. And, and so, you know, I've never really been a typical anything, you know, <laughs> and unfortunately my husband, my family encouraged me to be not typical, <laughs> you know, nobody's tried to box me in, I guess. So that's been a, that's been a good thing. Mark made the comment that you've had lived a, lived a hypertextual life. And that's, <laughs> that's a good argument there. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you, you click on something and something you don't expect comes up and that's, that's where you end up going. Yeah. <laughs> or you have to deal with that before you can go, go to the back button. <laughs> and sometimes you forget where the back button was so you just keep on going. But there wasn't, there is no back <laughs> button for life, is there? And that's the, exactly. that's what hypertext is exactly. such an ideal situation is we can go back and we can't in our, <laughs> yeah. in real life, IRL. That's right. That's for sure. So, uh, Marius, you probably have another question and that probably will be our last question. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask about the development of Hypergate. Uh, election of 1912, uh, Sucker and Spades, and then the Kings of, King, King of Space uh, by Sarah Smith, and then uh, the de development ceased. Uh, what was the reason? And uh, I'd like to connect that question with the question about the, the, the banner of serious hypertext. Because hypergate works do not, do, do connect uh, hypertext with game-like elements and simulation. They might be closer to interactive fiction and games than uh, story space um, hypertext. When and why did the divide uh, enter the hypertext discourse at some point? Great question. I, I think there's a couple of things here. Um, first, oh, I slash we have never been as vehemently opposed to games as some of the other story space people uh, were in the early years. Um, I've always thought that games were interesting and could come uh, for drinks, if perhaps not to dinner. <laughs> uh, there, there is a tension here, and we can amuse ourselves to death, but I didn't think that was really a likely problem. Uh, Hypergate was built on top of a fourth dialect for the map called Neon, uh, and Eastgate early on was pretty much a fourth shop. Uh, fourth is a now mostly forgotten language, still used occasionally for microcontrollers, uh, closely aligned, interestingly, to PostScript. And uh, it was extremely useful for two reasons. It was Lisp-like, but you could actually get it, which you couldn't do for Lisp if you wanted uh, to work on everyday machines. And it was extraordinarily memory efficient, which was really important for uh, working on these tiny little machines. Uh, on the other hand, you could crash it by looking at it sideways. It, it had nothing like type safety. Uh, you had to manage the stack yourself. It had no memory management at all. Uh, it had nothing like a compiler. Uh, so, and it always had a small coterie of really excellent programmers. Some of the people in the fourth community were amazing, but they, they were never numerous and you, no one learned fourth in school. 
Uh, so the platform, the, the, the language platform was clearly in a lot of trouble by the time we were do, doing King of Spades. Uh, I, by the end of King of Spades, or shortly after that, I was also deeply worried about uh, the ludic game-like elements, which uh, I'd re strongly encouraged as an editor in King of Space. And uh, while I think it, they're strong in 1912, I'm not sure that they uh, are uh, useful to what King of Space is trying to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet they were extraordinarily, extraordinarily difficult to implement. We did try to do a couple of collaborative titles with other people on Hypergate after that. But the difficulty of working on a dying uh, language platform uh, was formidable. And uh, Story Space was uh, catching fire in a way that we didn't originally expect and was tied to subtle issues in the then current uh, debates about the nature of textuality and the materiality of electronic text and so forth, uh, that it was necessary to participate in. Um, it was not much later uh, we found ourselves for two consecutive years on the front page of the New York Times book review. Yep. And I didn't know when we were doing 1912, that that was something that one could possibly wish for. <laughs> and by the time that it happened twice, I didn't know that it wasn't something that didn't happen to everyone <laughs> and that we couldn't expect to happen regularly forever. Um, so uh, we were on the side of a titanic conflict in the humanities. And uh, it was necessary to pay attention to that conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. That's, that is such a wonderful explanation of Hypergate and the transition into story space. Um, and that's a part of history that I've been very interested in. Be Belinda Barnett talks, uh, talks about it a bit in her book. But that's probably the most detailed information I've heard about Hypergate. So thank you for sharing that with Mariush and I. We're both fascinated by these platforms that you have built and, um, and all. There's no more questions coming from the, from the audience, and we're at um, 1121, so we're at the time we should stop. I do want to thank Mark and Aaron for being here today and for the rehearsal and all the time you put into this and the, the constant emails from me accepting my emails and responding to them. Um, thank you so much for your, for your help and for your um, you know, hospitality and time, both of you. Well, thanks for having us. So thank for you. The, you're so welcome. Absolutely, and, thank you. And for those of you in the audience, what we're doing with this um, video uh, capture is that uh, David Alonzo from the lab is going to be putting it together for Vimeo, and that will go on Vimeo pretty quickly. Then from there, this, all of this information the, um, the video, the sound uh, that John has been capturing will become a podcast. Um, images, uh, the social media post, all of that goes into a book called Re Rebooting Electronic Literature Volume 4 that um, the lab, you know, the lab puts out every year a volume of this, and this will be our fourth volume. And that will be available this summer, and it's free on Scalar so that we can document this uh, for long-term scholarship. So be looking for that book later on, but certainly when the, when the Vimeo videos are ready and the podcast is ready on SoundCloud, I'll be putting out a notice on Twitter and Facebook about that and on the Electronic Literature Lab blog. Once again, I want to thank Greg Philbrook for his time here with the OBS and YouTube Live, John Barber for his work with capturing all the sound quality so it's going to sound really good in the video, and thank you all of you for being here today and joining us at the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.